Today we'll be looking at Western Eyes, part two. Remember, the term Western Eyes comes from the documentary that we watched titled Western Eyes. To recap from last class, we were looking at the 1920s immigration patterns, as well as the restrictions, the quotas that were put in place to keep certain groups of immigrants in the 1920s out of migration patterns into the United States, which basically means they would not have the ability to migrate to the United States as a result of the POTA system. We started looking at Asian migration when we looked at the Transcontinental Railroad, the Chinese Exclusion Acts that restricted Chinese and then later applied to other Asian groups and the umbrella term that exists to uh, categorize people from China, Japan, India, and other parts of Asia uh, and pr primarily non-European countries. When we look at the data, we want to recap that in the 1920s, you saw an influx of migration, 1920s down here, and European and Asian migration numbers definitely vary. Going to watch the clip from Tyra Banks where she talks about the term ethnic tweaking and how minority groups tweak aspects of their ethnic outward identity to try to assimilate into the culture. To recap some of the things we looked at, we watched the documentary Western Eyes, we watched the episode of Sanford and Son, the Japanese restaurant, I just talked about Tyra Banks and the time reading, which uh, brings up the concept of the boomerang theory and how Asian high school students tend to drop their identity and then they are coming back like a boomerang to their Asian roots once they are in their 20s. I want to connect this to W.E.B. Du Bois and his piece on our spiritual strivings. And if we don't recall the reading here, what we want to focus on is Du Bois is a young boy and he is giving his card to this girl as he says here the exchange was merry and then the girl refuses his card and at that particular moment he comes to this realization of what it means to be african-american in america and he brings up the concept of double consciousness which is really looking at the dual identities you know you have the american identity and he's expressing that to be in america you also have to have some sort of african-american identity and that these two um identities kind of alter the way one thinks of themselves as a result of the way society views that particular group. And an interesting connection, King would write in the 60s about a very similar situation. And he talks about how when people have uh, a hostile encounter, that they tend to respond with different ways. Some will adjust, just like African Americans, some have adjusted to segregation. Uh, some will become insensitive to the situation, and then some will have a bitterness and hatred. And it's this bitterness and hatred that I'm concerned with as we transition to looking at some of the explosive racial incidents of the 1990s. For Asian migration, we're going to look at World War II. For the most part, just to kind of recap, we know that in the 1800s, you were building that railroad. Chinese starts to come over here. Then Chinese and Japanese starts to come over here. This then applied are led to the Exclusion Acts, and the Exclusion Acts included other groups. And then in the 1920s, those groups were not allowed. Uh, now we're looking at the 1940s, and uh, what's going on here is that the uh, Chinese are going to be uh, sent to relocation camps, and that's what this map here is trying to show you. At the end of, uh, at, uh, during the Pearl Harbor attacks, Americans started to become afraid of Japanese Americans, which is what you see here at this woman, her house, the sign. Here we see another, this government document looking at the uh, executive order that's going to eventually put Japanese American citizens in internment camps. Why? Two reasons. It's to uh, protect these individuals for their safety because they probably will become victims in the society that's going to view them as outsiders, as well as because of the lack of trust with regard to the Japanese Americans. Ansel Adams would document in this piece, Born Free and Equal. And here we have some photographs of what it was like to be in these Japanese internment camps. Eventually, during World War II, the uh, United States would try to uh, 
come up with charts to identify the difference between Chinese and Japanese as this chart right here is trying to let people know the differences between the two. And uh, it's looking at, uh, you know, for example, here it says yellow complexion, and this says earthly yellow complexion. And this would be used to be able to distinguish the Chinese from the Japanese. Here we see yet another example. This one would come later where they're trying to figure out the difference between individuals. And, uh, you know, there's only one race, the human race. And when you're buying into this idea of different racial groups, uh, Chinese, Japanese, that would not count as a racial group. Um, you know, we're identifying them based on nation, but we're trying to identify certain physical features that are different from one group to another, utilizing this particular chart after World War II. And then later on, whenever this chart here is about, just remember whenever you're trying to identify people based on a outward expression or you know perceived racial characteristic, you're probably going to be into a, uh, you know, it's gonna be a tough area, a tough uh, task. For example, if we take this chart right here, how can we apply it to this individual? You know, how would you come to a conclusion about this individual's race, for lack of a better word, or this individual? If you think you can apply this chart here on the concept of race, good luck. Um, or, you know, this example here, which I threw in here because, you know, today, present day, uh, people probably look at this and identify K-pop. But I don't necessarily know that K-pop would be a racial criteria used to define a racial group. So again, I'm just trying to point out the flawed system and race. Then what do we do with people like Bali London, who has come out as a transracial individual as a result of trying to make himself look Korean as a British male? Anyway, if you're trying to come up with uh, some sort of chart, you're probably in some sort of uh, rough territory with regard to you know, racism. Anyway, let's kind of recap the conflict, World War II, we just kind of addressed. For the most part, the wars are going to lead to a situation where more groups are going to come here. For example, at the end of, at the, end of uh, the Korean War, you're going to see an influx of Koreans, and then the Vietnam War is going to bring Vietnamese and Cambodian. And each war is going to increase the group of one thing we'll look at is this concept of the good minority. I did a Google search here for the good minority. And it's really looking at Asian migration patterns and how those groups kind of assimilate into the United States. We'll look at the myth of the good minority. But for now, we're going to be looking at some of the history. For example, here we're looking at the second wave in 1951. Uh, this is a result of the Korean War. And then 1965 becoming really a year of reversal, going back to those Chinese Exclusion Acts, where you're going to see, you know, the 1860s Chinese Exclusion Acts, where it's going to now be a reversal. And you're going to start to see more groups starting to come over. Koreans would be one group that's going to benefit the Vietnam War. At the end of the Vietnam War, the United States would leave Vietnam as well as Cambodia. Here we see an image of the United States, the last helicopter is leaving and all of these Vietnamese refugees from the Vietnam War trying to get out and make it to the United States. But for the most part, at the end of the Vietnam War, you'll see people from Vietnam as well as Cambodia starting to migrate to the United States, which brings up this concept that we'll look at in the California Killing Fields, which is a documentary. And for the most part, it's about Cambodian gangs and how Cambodian gangs in the 1970s had come here and they would be called uh, various names and um, that were referencing the Vietnam War. And some of these groups decided to, or some of these Cambodians decided to create gangs like the Tiny Rascal Gang or the Asian Boys. And they kind of mimicked African-American gangs. This is a scene from the film Menace to Society. We'll probably watch a clip about that showing the tension between Koreans and African-Americans living in California. India migration patterns. Here we see yet another group that's going to start migrate to the United States, and we are going to see the 65 Immigration Nationality Act, which again is removing the quotas. And you'll see an influx of people from India migrating to the United States. And here are some comments, the backlash to Indian uh, families, you know, getting the uh, day off for Diwali. South Brunswick being one of the first towns in the state of New Jersey to, you know, give off on a school calendar for that particular day. And the backlash was uh, you know, what this really is about here. People are upset about the changing nature of the United States once you give off students for this particular holiday. And it could probably be any holiday. 
as you can see, this parent really upset about you know Christian holidays not being celebrated yet. They're looking at Indian holidays. We'll be looking at these clips in class and trying to point out some of the you know entertainment portrayal of some of the uh, Asian groups as they come to the United States before we make a transition to the film Do the Right Thing. Again, uh, we want to continue to think about the good minority as we transition to looking at the LA riots. In the LA riots, one thing that's usually not discussed is the tension between African Americans and the Korean um, migrants that were in California. For example, the Latasha Harlan's killing, where the woman, Soon Ja Du, winds up getting a probation reduced sentence for the killing of Latasha Harlan's, which was one of the reasons for the uh, LA riots, tension between Koreans and African Americans. Here we see some. A rap song by Ice Cube about Little Korea. And again, I'm looking at this to show the tension between the two groups. Um, and eventually we'll get into the LA riots where pretty much Koreans would be targeted by African Americans and forced to defend themselves, which is what those images are about. And that's pretty much where we're at here. We want to think about some of these ideas with regard to violence and how people treat each other. We don't want to forget about the immigration patterns that led to this particular influx of Asian migration patterns into the United States. That's